Warm welcome back to the program. He's an old mate. He gives so generously of his time. He calls the A-League. Simon Hill, I'm going to say Happy New Year because we haven't spoken, dude. How are you? Yeah, I'm good. Happy New Year to you as well. Thank you so much. Just a quick word on the Football World Cup. How good was that final, mate? Yeah, terrific. Um, I, to be honest, I thought the whole tournament was was great from a football uh, sense of the word. Um, obviously, it helped in our neck of the woods that Australia did pretty well as well. But uh, yeah, I thought it was a terrific tournament. Uh, the off-field stuff, obviously, is is you know a different story and requires much uh, more in-depth discussion. But uh, I thought, as so far as the football went, I thought I thought it was a brilliant World Cup, and uh, we got a final to match. How big a distraction in the end was it over there? Uh, because I, I just happened to be on holiday with my boys and my brother in the United States for the quarters, semis, and final, and there was there, there was zero, just nothing about any of the protests or, or anything to do with any of it. Yeah, <clears throat> well, I mean that's what they were banking on. Uh, you know, the, uh, the once the tournament started, the uh, speculation and reports about all uh, the off-field stuff and how they won the World Cup and their treatment of migrant workers and uh, you know human rights, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, uh, that all faded away because the they they know that the world loves football. Uh, so once the football started, that was always going to be the case that people were going to become more obsessed with the narratives uh, on the pitch. And uh, that's the way it turned out. And, uh, you know, you've got to say that their their gamble in that regard paid off. But, uh, you know, that, that doesn't mean to say that uh, it was right that it went there in the first place, uh, particularly uh, in the method that it was won by Qatar. But uh, anyway, as I say, that's probably a discussion that's going to take uh, – about three hours. <laughs> <laughs> we don't have that time, my friend. Let's yeah. talk A-League to start. But before we get on to the Phoenix, we're on a great run of form at the moment. Dwight York um, exited by MacArthur. Obviously, I mean, you know, I mean, the, all the stuff that's written about this, I mean, the PR fluff and guff. I mean, it sounds as though, look, he had a right rip at the players. The chairman, the CEO, were present. Players didn't like his attitude or the way he was speaking. I don't know whether this was the first time. You might have a bit more intel on that. Simon, what do you know about this? Well, it's pretty much the same as uh, as you. Uh, you know what I've read, what I've heard, um, spoken to a couple of people, but uh, it's difficult to get more information out than is already out there. And of course, there's you know there's going to be the sanitised version that uh, you know we parted companies amicably, parted company amicably, and you know Dwight wishes the club all the best and all that sort of stuff. But so uh, you know it's pretty clear that behind the scenes that there's been a massive fallout. Um, you know, between uh, Dwight and not just his players, but I, th I think the leaders of the club, Gino Mara, the chairman, Sam Kreslovich, the CEO, uh, both of whom can be combustible characters, and I'm sure Dwight can be as well. So it's it's unfortunate, and unfortunate because, you know, Dwight had done a pretty good job to, to start off with. He'd won the Australia Cup. They were in a, a decent, if not brilliant, position in, in the A-League. And I think there was a lot more to come from both them and him. Uh, and I hope he's not lost to the game in Australia because, you know, we've 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 lost Charlie Austin, we've lost Nani to injury, and Dwight York was probably the third biggest name out of that trio, and uh, now he's gone as well. So it's it's really unfortunate. This is the second time, of course, he's been involved with the A-League. He won a title with Sydney, uh, and he actually played bloody well when he was down here. He loves the nightclub, mm -hmm. he loves the party, he gets involved in that as well. Uh, you know, as far as his managerial career goes, I mean, he seems like such a laid-back guy. I've I've interviewed him and spoken with him before. I mean, I'm a Man mm. United fan. I just adored him when he played for us, Simon. But just some of the comments that you know have been reported about the standards that he demands and he expects. And no, I mean that sounds fair enough to me. When you've won a Champions League, when you've won Premier League titles, when you've played at that level, I don't see how you can ever approach any situation involving being involved with a football team without without having that as your standard. Yeah, couldn't agree more. Um, and again, you know, we, we have to be careful what we say because yeah, we don't honest. exactly yeah, know yeah. what's been said behind closed doors. But you know, if it's if it's about Dwight demanding better standards and you know the club railing against that, then you know, really, that's a massive problem. Not not just for MacArthur, but for the, the league as well. And uh, you know, one of the reasons people like Dwight are brought to this country is to raise those standards. And as you rightly point out, he's won the UEFA Champions League. He's played at a World Cup. He's won the Premier League. Uh, you know, Dwight's sort of been there, done it all, got the T-shirt. So it, it's without knowing exactly what's gone on, <clears throat> I'm sort of tempering my words a little bit. Sure. But, uh, 
I, I'm massively disappointed that he is no longer a coach in the A League. I hope he's going to stay in Australia, but uh, yeah, I mean, obviously, he's, you know, since the decision was made, he's gone to ground, and we don't know. But uh, I, I do hear we we might we might know something a bit more by the end of the week, and I certainly hope so. So Robbie Fowler is a manager; he's gone as well. I mean, are these players really of value to the A League as managers, or are they more value as players because they don't really tend to get you know they don't talk a lot when they're managers. I mean, they don't really get put up at press conferences. I mean, you don't get that much out of them. Um, well, I don't know about that. I mean, I think Dwight and, and Robbie certainly did their fair share of, uh, you know, radio and television interviews. Um, yeah, I mean, obviously, it's not going to have exactly the same impact as, you know, when they're players. And of course, both did, did a stint as a player here as well, Robbie too. Um, but I, look, I'm not saying that they are the panacea to the, to the competition's problems uh, or the answer to all the competition's ills. But I think they can they can certainly add some value, and I'll, I'll give you one other example. Yeah. You know, the, I've I've talked about the you know the fact that Nani got injured, that Charlie Austin's been and gone already, that Dwight York's left Macarthur. Uh, you know, probably the biggest name still left in the competition is Alessandro Diamante, and and he showed us at the weekend just why, even at the age of thirty nine, he is still a marquee player in all but name. Uh, he still has that box office appeal in terms of his quality. And he lifts standards. The goal he scored against Sydney was phenomenal. That is a world-class goal. And I don't think we make enough of Alessandro Diamante, quite frankly. Um, we had him on the radio show, my radio show, on Tuesday night. And he was he was just absolutely brilliant. Mm. You know, he's, he's got such passion for the game. And obviously played at the top level, Serie A, English Premier League, Italian national team. And he's still doing it at the age of 39. Um, but because he's been here a little while, we we almost sort of forget about him. Um, and it's it's ludicrous, really, because they, they, these guys have got so much to offer and they have played at the very, very highest level of the game. Yeah, just one more question on this. Simon Hill with us, uh, A-League, we're talking out of Aussie. Uh, is, is just that, you know, knowing how... How, how many players were from the A-League in that Australian squad, which, is, as you said, did so well at the World Cup getting out of the qualifying group? I mean, anything that is about raising the standard, is about attracting players, is you know, is about actually making this league, this Australia-centric league, you know, better and the standard better, the quality better, and, and players wanting to play <laughs> in this. call it an Australia-centric league? Well, yes, essentially <laughs> it is. I mean, okay, we're there. I mean, but it's the same as the, look, the same as the NRL. It's very generous you let us play in your league. I mean, that's how we look at it, you know. I mean, yeah, I mean, and I know that most of Australia, Simon, thinks that New Zealand's just another island. I mean, we accept this over here. <laughs> <laughs> I just I love that turn of phrase, the Australia centric league. I mean, it is the Australian league. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I'm no, just you know, um, I mean, I'm just saying. I mean, I'm not. I know. I'm. 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 I'm not playing little brother here. I'm just you know saying. You know how we kind of perhaps feel a little. I mean, we we are part of it, but you know we're part of it only because you let us be part of it. Okay. Well, of course you're part of it. Um, but uh, you know, like all the other clubs, you have to contribute. Mm -hmm. Um, but uh, you know, I I, I love what Ufuk Tale is doing at uh, Wellington Phoenix. Uh, he continues to confound the critics year in, year out, of which I'm normally one. I, you know, I look at the, the, the team's pre-season and I think, Wellington, nah, they're not going to make it this year. And they always do. Um, <clears throat> and they're making monkeys out of us again. I mean, uh, you know, they're up in, where are they at the moment? Fourth. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, with a chance, they, they could be second by the end of this latest round. So uh, he, he does a terrific job. He, he's got a, a great eye for a player. Um, you know, Bozidar Krayev and Oscar Zavada are the two latest examples. Ulysses Davila was probably the first. And, you know, there's been a few in between, no doubt. So uh, the Phoenix certainly, uh, you know, add, add that value at the moment. There's no doubt about that. Yeah, three wins in a row. Uh, they're on a bit of a tear and winning those games back to back away from home as well. Uh, we spoke to uh, Zavada on the programme the other day. A nice chap. He is a long, long way from home. I mean, I mean, so are you, Simon. I'm always interested and fascinated by, you know, why sure. people come 12,000 miles away to, you know, the end of the earth. And, I mean, for a guy that, he said, grew up near the Russian border in Poland, I mean, you couldn't actually get a more far away place or a different kind of place to play, could you? Well, that's true. But, you know, sometimes that brings its own attraction. Um, you know, some of us have the wanderlust. Uh, I'm not sure about Oscar. I've never met him. I haven't spoken to him, but... You know, the, the great thing about football is that it can take you all over the world. Now, I'm a, you know, runny nose kid from uh, from Manchester in Northern England, uh, and football has taken me to every single continent um, and to some places that I didn't even know exist before I had to go there in football. So it's, you know, it's the best sport in the world for that. And, 
Yeah, you know, if, if a club comes in for you and you're a professional, then, you know, you've got to earn your living somewhere. And uh, if it's New Zealand, if it's Australia, if it's Poland or Austria or Honduras or Belize, it doesn't matter, does it? You, uh, it's, it's part of the great experience of being involved in this global game. Finally, and an ugly one to finish with, but we haven't really heard anything about the fallout from that crowd violence at the Melbourne Derby. Uh, what do you know about that? And how on earth can Football Australia and the A-Leagues you know, try and prevent that? Because they've tried before. I mean, you know, you're banning guys from coming in. It doesn't seem to work. I mean, how do you stop that from happening again? Well, first of all, I mean, the, the sanctions were handed down. The final sanctions were handed down, I think it was the start of last week. Um, so Victory had been fined around $500,000, which is the largest fine ever imposed upon uh, any team in the National Leagues, NSL or A-League. Uh, Ten points deduction suspended uh, and hanging over them. If it happens again, they will get a 10-point deduction. Um, the active fans are banned for the rest of the season. No away tickets to be sold. I mean, they're, they're pretty hefty sanctions. So to, for today's Big Blue, for example, which is normally one of the biggest uh, games of the season, there will be no victory fans in the bay behind the goal, although, although there is some rumour that uh, the original style Melbourne is going to try and get in somewhere else in the ground, which might be interesting. Um, so, you know, victory have been hit pretty hard. And to be honest, they're a club that is suffering at the moment and uh, both on and off the pitch. And it's unfortunate because they're our biggest club. But uh, how do you stop it? Look, I don't know whether you can. Um, you know, you, you can ban people for life. Apparently, a couple of those people who were on the pitch in the, in the Melbourne Derby were banned for life. Well, that didn't work, did it? No. Uh, so unless you can have full body scanners, you know, outside sports stadiums, I don't know how you enforce that uh, to the letter of the law. All you can do is, you know, try and educate people and, and ask, ask fans to self-police um, and, you know, just remind people as well that 99.9% .9 of people behave impeccably. And by the way, it's the same with the other codes. They, they love to jump up and down and point the fingers at us when this stuff happens, and rightly so. But when it happens in their sports, it's normally buried on page eight. That's the difference.